So we're here this morning with Joy Anderson at Wesleyan University, where Joy is teaching a class as a visiting faculty member. We have a Patricelli Center for Social Entrepreneurship here at Wesleyan. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. And Joy comes to us from the Criterion Institute. And I thought maybe we would just begin by talking a little bit about what the, what the Institute does. Criterion is an activist organization of all things. We actually believe in creating market activists. Market so, activists. Market activists. So we've had political activists. You know, Wesleyan's created a few political activists who believe they can change the rules of how governments work. They believe they can change political systems. So at its core, Criterion believes that there's no more important time for us to change the rules of market systems, of how finance works, of how entrepreneurship works, mm-hmm. of how we build businesses. And so how would you actually create people who feel empowered to do that? Oh, interesting. So when I, when I was a student, activists kind of thought the market was bad, right? Yes, so that you know, we activists were trying to train, get away from the market, and activism was kind of anti-market in a way. Exactly. It sounds like uh, th- this has changed. It has. I mean, one of the amazing things that's happened in the movement of social entrepreneurship and impact investing is, is two things. One is a discovery that, that actually you can do good through business. That you that, can, yeah. That there isn't sort of something intrinsically evil. Right in the you know competitive forces of the market. The second thing, which I think is equally important, is it's not just that the market is okay, it's that we made this up. The market isn't huh. something right. that just sort of naturally operates. There is no invisible hand. Mm-hmm. That actually these are systems that human beings made up. Mm-hmm. And so the social innovators, the social entrepreneurs, the impact investors in the world actually think they can change those systems. That maybe the rules of finance or the rules of business are not the rules that always have to exist, and we can actually change how those systems work. So that's the core of what Criterion works on, is sort of how do you do that? How how do you actually change Mm -hmm. how, sounds wonky, but like how do you change how things work? So it's interesting because this course has, as, it, as at its origin, the, the Social Good Summit at the 92nd right. Street Y uh, in the fall of 2013. And I was struck uh, when I participated in the, that uh, meeting how many uh, of the speakers were coming from private enterprise. Uh, there, were, this, there was also the UN Foundation and there were not-for-profit groups. But many of the people making presentations were uh, from the corporations large and small yep. and one of the themes i heard them uh coming back to was that governments had failed to do this mm. um and that and nonprofits and 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 not 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 for profits were kind of they were small i mean they could do certain things but they they didn't have the reach and so some of these big corporations were changing the their behavior in some ways for business reasons but they were actually also positively positive social reasons and uh, but they had lo- almost as they had lost their faith in the governments to do things uh, because the governments were short-sighted in a right. way, and the companies, with their eye on long-term profits or long-term viability or sustainability, they were stepping into the space, and uh, because they because they could actually create new things in this space, and it yeah. sounds like. Criterion is finding organizations that mean to do that? Let me cover that point first, and okay. I'll go back to what we actually do, because okay. it's, it's a day-to-day. So if you take those corporations mm-hmm. or you know new entrepreneurs or whatever, enterprises mm-hmm. that are for-profit, right? they exist to create right. profit. I actually don't quite buy, and I think in some ways, there's, there's particularly now 20 or 30 years into this movement around social entrepreneurship, there's a little less dismissal that the government has failed, mm-hmm. and a little more, how about we use all the toys? Right. 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 So yeah. like, let's yeah. stop bashing the government. Right. How about we stop bashing NGOs? Let's just actually use all the possible That's, strategies right. for social change. You don't have to choose just one second. <laughs> to say the government failed so we're the heroes it's like wow governments can do some things but if you're trying to create durable change in fisheries Mm -hmm. in indonesia right the government might not be necessarily the first way to go right right so the idea and conservation organizations i think are a classic juxtaposition of this because the environmental movement and conservation organizations in particular like wwf and world wildlife fund and environmental defense fund has basically said regulation Mm -hmm. policy change is how we'll win on these fights right 
okay, except they didn't win. Yeah. It didn't work. Yeah. And so now they're sort of saying, well, why don't we use all the toys? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why don't we work with corporations as well and mm -hmm. launch some new companies and participate in capital markets so we can use all the strategies available to us? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think that was the spirit of the Social Goods Summit is that um, we need all of these sectors to align in some respects to have the maximum impact. Right, and right. And it's very hard to get them to do that. But to dismiss one sector as being beyond repair or just being it has failed was really counterproductive. Right. And, and social change is wicked hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the basic piece. Mm -hmm. And so my one, I started working in impact investing. So most of my career is in investing. Mm -hmm. um, and although I was a high school teacher for about a decade and then made a transition into working in investing. Um, one of those natural transitions <laughs> that just happens overnight. They do say that if you teach high school in New York City, you can do anything That's afterwards. That, I suppose and that is a great test. as I later launched a venture fund, I was like, I was a high school teacher in Brooklyn. I'm sorry, of course you I can launch anything. a venture yeah. fund. Yeah. But some of the fallacies in finance and in social entrepreneurship really came from a place of arrogance. That mm. There was a we'll come in and we'll fix everything faster, better. Right. And that's backfired as well. And so I think this sort of role of humility of really thinking through, mm -hmm. um, if you're going to do business and social change together, you have to be twice as good at business and twice as good at social change. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's just hard. Yeah. So could you give me an example or two of some of the things that have worked well for Criterion where they've yeah. you've seen that made a real impact? So right now we work on two things actually, um, well three. One is we have a community of entrepreneurs around the world, kind of community practice of leaders who on any given Tuesday are trying to change the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. And they may not be running, some of them are entrepreneurs, some of them are investors, many of them are philanthropists or program officers at big foundations. And we talk about the practices of changing the rules of the game. How do you actually do that? So that's the first thing. Our own practice areas are in two initiatives right now, and mm -hmm. we've done a few different things over 13 years, but two right now. One is we lead a movement around investing with a gender lens, mm -hmm. right? So thinking about gender in the context of social entrepreneurship, in the context of investing, how would we change how we did investing if we actually understood gender? Um, and there's an interesting background to that, which I think is, um, uh, we, we can dig into that later. Yes. Um, the second thing is, of all things, we work on the role of the church. So uh -huh. thinking about churches in particularly the United States, and we have a campaign right now to have a thousand churches invest in micro businesses in their local community. So how do you actually use capital in the sort of bread and butter of local communities mm -hmm. of very small businesses? And, and both of these really are about um, taking groups, you know, a, a African American church in south of Mississippi, do they mm -hmm. see themselves as part of creating a different economy? Mm -hmm. Or do they just sort of say, oh crap, this sucks, we're victims of it. Mm -hmm. And how do you actually shift those roles? Which mm -hmm. is, again, this idea of market activism. So in market activism with, uh, with churches, uh, the idea is to uh, create a network of churches that have that work to g in sync with each other, or can you say a little Mostly bit more about it? Mostly to demonstrate that we can at, at its simplest. Mm -hmm. um, we're encouraging churches to think through what kind of economic relationships do they want to be in. I see. How would they organize an investment? How would they walk across the street and loan somebody money? I see. And say, all right, I've got a thousand dollars. You're a small business. How would we then structure that relationship? Mm -hmm. Because what tends to happen mm -hmm. is folks say, well, oh, you know, I don't. What if it went wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, because in business, all this evil stuff mm -hmm. happens, and I might lend somebody money, and then and they not pay me thing, back, yeah. and then it ruins my relationship. Uh -huh. So what I'd rather have happen is for them to put it on a credit card, have that be bought and sold five times in the capital markets, and then uh -huh. eventually come back and be my money that actually mm -hmm. made all these investments happen. We're trying to figure out how do I actually have really honest conversations mm -hmm. 
about what kind of economic relationships we want to be in. So kind of owning the way you use capital. Exactly. I see, rather than just anonymously circulating it. Exactly. So we launched this out of Clinton Global Initiative about mm -hmm. a year ago, um, and it's been incredibly successful in terms of getting people to rethink things, mm -hmm. which I think is back to entrepreneurship. I think right. there is, across the board, what I am so excited and you know, I've run a venture fund. Mm -hmm. I've I was one of the founding. I was the founding board chair of something called Village Capital. Like I've been playing mm -hmm. in the space of social entrepreneurship for the last ten years, mm -hmm. which is um, the field is not that much longer right. yeah. <laughs> older than that. So, and I've had a catbird seat because mm -hmm. of because of my role in Good Capital as a founder of a venture fund I, that that ended up you know spinning off SoCap mm -hmm. and the Hub mm -hmm. and all kinds of other things. Because of that role, I just had a, an amazing seat to, to watch people do exactly what these churches are mm -hmm. doing, which is to say, I don't know, maybe it doesn't have to work that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could create change the game. We can change the game. We mm -hmm. can invent a different way of doing this. We can rethink um, products in the emerging market. We can um, rethink um, what are the real solutions to climate change. And, and that's what's fun. So let's 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 talk. I want to come back to gender later in our conversation, but let's talk a little bit more about entrepreneurship because sure. um, the uh, the field has shifted so dramatically in the last fifteen years or so. Yeah. And uh, and it's and and I have to say that most of the students in this class will be from outside the United States. Right. And entrepreneurship may have some a different sense, a different meaning there. So I want to talk a little bit more about entrepreneurship, and we'll come back to gender uh, later in the conversation. You know, the the the, the meaning of what of uh, the entrepreneur, the kind of cultural uh, capital of right. of entrepreneurship, has changed so much, especially in this country, perhaps also in Western Europe. I'm not sure. Uh, I know less about the rest of the world. Uh, you know, when I was a, a student, uh, activists certainly didn't think of themselves yeah. as entrepreneurs. Um, liberal arts institutions like Wesleyan right. didn't think they needed to be cultivating entrepreneurship. Right. And now every every school, and, every you know, school. Really high schools that have entrepreneurship centers. Absolutely. And they said the entrepreneur is hero has developed and and then social entrepreneurship has developed more recently and I I know it's a big subject but maybe you can give us a little bit of a sketch especially sure. for people watching us from outside the US it's hard because in some ways entrepreneurs are just a ridiculous myth right. I mean the like idea, a cowboy in some ways right uh, that's I'm just uh, teaching a Western so the hero <laughs> riding off in into the sunset it's, it's just a it's it's actually a load of bunk uh -huh. um, Partly because, and, and, and a lot of us talk about this, we celebrate the hero entrepreneur, not their organization, mm. not their networks, not their customers, right. not the, the ecosystem that actually makes them successful. And that's just, that's just silly. I mean, it, 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 it means that we somehow think this individual. Right, all has by a, herself or himself. All by, and, and, and usually by himself, just <laughs> yeah, to be clear. Yeah. That, you know, that little tension there. Yeah. Um, gender issues and race issues mm -hmm. and cultural issues. And, you know, um, do you come from a culture that actually wants to promote individuals mm -hmm. to that extent? Right. Um, and are you, are you from a culture that actually thinks, because there's a kind of arrogance, confidence, uh, chutzpah mm -hmm. that an entrepreneur has to have to survive? Yes. Or they'll be eaten. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, because there is something that's important in that, though, mm -hmm. which is the risk taking. Yes. So for me, what's important is that somebody stepped out and said, you know what, this could be different, and I will raise my hand and say I'll try. That's right, and it's not, the, and the outcome isn't assured. That's the, the outcome key. isn't insured, and what's what's important about understanding about entrepreneurs is that they don't have a job. Nobody <laughs> hired them. Yeah. Nobody said, I'm going to give you permission right. to go do these five tasks on Tuesday. Right. There is something absolutely core about an entrepreneur who says, I don't want a job. I don't want somebody to be telling me what to do on any given day. I think I can create something different and I'm willing to take the risks 
that that takes. Where I think a lot of colleges have actually gone wrong in how they do education of entrepreneurs is I get entrepreneurs who, who people who graduate from entrepreneurial programs right. show up at Criterion and they're like, so I want a job. As an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur. Yeah. So it's really nice that you took all those risks, but I really want stability. Or they show up at a at a venture competition and say, well, I can't possibly do anything unless I'm fully funded for five years <laughs> and I have all the stability. No I'm just like, yeah. actually, you don't get to have autonomy right. and control and safety. Right. You have to actually buy some things. I mean, I was a high school teacher 15 mm -hmm. years ago. I launched a venture fund. People ask me all the time, how did you do that? I said, right. well, nobody was going to hire me to work in a venture fund, mm -hmm. so I started one. Yeah. And I didn't have the capital. My parents are Lutheran ministers, mm -hmm. and I never had money. To date, I have never had a bank of capital. I built relationships with people who did and figured out how to aggregate enough. And so it's that... It's that ability to say, I'm not going to be waited, I'm not going to wait to be invited mm -hmm. to a table. I'm just going to set the table that I think needs to exist. That's a great way of putting it. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 does the word inventor um, have a, 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 a big overlap with, uh, with the, the entrepreneur? Well, if you think about many, many inventors, not for me, because I think actually there are inventors and innovators who sit in all kinds of different places. Mm -hmm. You can be innovative in a job. You can invent things. Most inventors actually have federal funding and sit over in the science building over there and actually invent things. Mm -hmm. It's that I think there is something in business that is different mm -hmm. that is saying, I'm going to build the thing. I'm going to build the organization. Yeah, that's that it's not just it. the product, it's, it's the platform, not, right? Because <laughs> really, for those, those who create um, Venture Well, not Venture Well, the national, the, there's a group. I'm going to forget the acronym, mm -hmm. but there's a group that works on um, inventions in science right. on college campuses. The first thing they have to learn is like, having invented this way cool thing doesn't mean that you have funding for it, doesn't mean that you know how to produce it efficiently, doesn't know how to mean you know how to distribute it, doesn't mean that you know how to um, market it. All of those things that actually are what give you the autonomy yeah. is that you run the business. So, so the entrepreneur... Uh, um, creates a, the sustainable organization through which inventions happen. Exactly. I see. So, so it's that's where that platform rather than product, right? Platform I mean, versus product, because the product is a dime a dozen. Like you know. Man, that's hard. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. A, I, I'm not a big believer in intellectual property. I, I mean, I. I, I value it. I know that it's, it's the, important. It's the ecosystem that you're looking for, right? Or the well, organization. And, well, frankly, it's, it's, it's execution. Mm -hmm. Like, I've had a lot of ideas. Right. <laughs> the number of them that I could mm -hmm. execute yes. is where it gets pragmatic. Because it's all well and good to say, this is how the world should be different. Mm -hmm. And this is my crazy idea that, or brilliant idea mm -hmm. that will transform the world. If you can't get it done, it doesn't matter. So, so tell tell me a little bit about um, social entrepreneurship. So, because right. the, the 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 hero uh, risk taker creates a sustainable organization, has, you know, builds a team around him right. or her, usually him, as you say. Um, the goal there is uh, profit and, sust and sustainability through profit. Social entrepreneurship is different, and and uh, I think. For some of our uh, students in this class, they'll, they'll know a lot about it. But for some of them, I think it's, it's a, it'll be a new term. So maybe you could say a little bit about how you understand social entrepreneurship and how it has evolved. I think it's a little different, but basically the same. It's basically some, somebody or a team of people stepping out and saying, the way the world is changing right now, the way mm -hmm. the world is working right now is not acceptable. So I'm going to use all of this risk-taking chutzpah and mm -hmm. guts and I'm going to go do it to create a different world. I think it's really the only difference is the intent. So it's not the intent is not to uh, is not to uh, get money for their investors, or it's the intent is to change the world, or to make an improvement, or make a change. So I would almost say it's just an additive intent. You probably you might still want to make money. You might still huh. want to. Um, 
create, you might want to still be a big deal. You might still want to be famous. You might still have all that arrogance. Many social entrepreneurs are very profitable. I mean, you can actually make a profit and change the world. It's hard, but it's possible. So, so in that sense, the social entrepreneur uh, can be running a profit-oriented enterprise Absolutely. as long as part of the intention is to uh, improve the lives of the people who are interacting with the organization. Is that exactly? Well, I mean, if you think about, I don't know, your role, you run hopefully a profitable organization. We never we lose money slowly, but we're not you lose money slowly. <laughs> but your investments make a profit, yes. and you seek for your investments to make a profit. You seek every day to figure out how to grow your endowment versus shrink it to have be more valuable to your students so they are willing to pay the delightful tuition that mm -hmm. you charge. You're looking to compete in a market. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're so different mm -hmm. than a for-profit company. It's just that your intent is also to create amazing students who lead the world. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have any investors who need to reach a monetary turn on investment. And so we're able to offer the class that we're taping this for for free because we actually don't have to uh, uh, return a uh, profit for investors. We, we do want to satisfy right. their belief in the mission of the organization to educate more people, to share our knowledge. That is a return. And the people who, let's say, donate money to Wesleyan, we, you know, I'm hoping they'll be pleased by the things we do because we are trying to work on our, you know, fulfill our mission. And in that sense, you know, like other companies, we have a mission. But I do think we don't so, have a mission to um, increase the wealth of our sure. of our shareholders. The lines. What has happened in the last 20 years mm -hmm. is that the lines between I'm in it for the profit and I'm not mm -hmm. have gotten really blurred. A couple things have happened. One is how you think about the marketplace, right? Yes. That you have fair trade products. Yes. And then all of a sudden you have consumers that you can actually potentially charge a premium on a product it's because fair it's fair trade. trade. Yeah. All right, that's a different logic. Yeah. The second thing, and then whether or not it's, you know, having invested in a fair trade company that went bankrupt, you know, isn't yeah. working is it's, an it interesting work, question. Right? Yeah. But there is a, there are, there is a, there's a, um, a reasonable hypothesis mm -hmm. that that's true. Mm -hmm. Second thing is um, expectations of investors have also shifted. Yes. And that's complicated. There are now many, many, many investors who want you to both yeah. have social good and, and profit. Yeah, that's, that's a great and, point. And so the expectations of investors have shifted. And even in the public markets, in, in bond markets, there's a sensitivity in bond markets to whether or not Walmart is sustainable. Yes. Our logic about this differentiation between this is for social good and this is for profit, as if we could keep those cleanly separate. And so I think it actually, it, um, it increases the complexity for all of us yeah. because there isn't some stamp that we can put on your forehead mm -hmm. that says Wesleyan's good because it's not for profit and yeah. Walmart's bad because it's clearly for profit and we can just divide those lines and know who to trust. Right.